the racist history of Portland, the whitest city in America. It's known as a modern day hub of progressivism, but its past is one of exclusion. This was written by Elena Samuels, published for The Atlantic on July 22nd, 2016. This is the main article we will be reading today, but before we do that, let's get into the intro. What's up, everybody? Thanks for clicking this video. Thanks for tuning in. My name's Simon Hill, 33 year old black American man from Louisiana, filming this video on December 15th, 2023, out here in Budapest, Hungary. Now, the reason we're covering Oregon today is because often I catch myself daydreaming, thinking about the future, what will happen to myself, my wife, and our future children, and where we will end up. And returning to America ranks pretty high on my list. It's something I consider deeply. It's something that plagues my mind often, primarily because I want to return to America to make a better world for the people that will come after me. I do believe that if we are sincere about fighting global oppression uh, and anti-blackness and white supremacy, we need to be in the epicenter of where all of those things occur. I do think it's important for people to live the best lives that they can, and if anybody cannot deal with the anti-blackness that exists in America, they should find greener pastures elsewhere. But if we are going to be the soldiers or martyrs that will make a better world, some of us will have to be in the fight. So going back to America ranks pretty high on my list, also because of the economic opportunity as well. And I do not picture myself living in the deep red Bible belt south like how i grew up with people waving confederate flags segregated communities all that stuff that i saw growing up in louisiana so no the south is absolutely off my list but then again if you're south of canada like malcolm x said you're in the south anyway I look at places that are large metropolitan areas like Seattle, Chicago, L.A., uh, New York, Boston, and Portland, because these are places that are in generally blue states. They are somewhat progressive, at least in their image to other parts of the country. And also there's a lot of economic opportunity there. So uh, I started doing some more digging on Portland, a place that, you know, checked a lot of the boxes of what I want in the future city where I will raise my family. Uh, but uh, when we started doing some more digging, I was very disheartened and how can I say this? Unsurprised. So let's get into this. We start off every video with the map because unfortunately a lot of people don't know geography. Oregon is this large state here on the west coast of the country bordered by Idaho, Nevada, California, and Washington. It's considered a part of the Pacific Northwest. Oregon joined the United States on February 14th, 1859. It was the 33rd state to join the Union. And for people that want to know about the cities here, the major city here, and I believe most of the population lives in the Portland metropolitan area. There are major, there are other cities that are notable as well, such as Newport, Salem, and that sort of stuff. Now, before we get into the main article that I was starting off this video with, the racist history of Portland, let's do a little bit of history. Black exclusion laws in Oregon. This comes from the Oregon Encyclopedia, written by historians whose job is to look at Oregon's history. So for any of the white supremacists or people who want to discount anything that I'm going to say in this video, take it up with the historians. So all the links to all the articles will be in the description. Oregon's racial makeup has been shaped by three black exclusion laws that were in place during much of the region's early history. These laws, all later rescinded, largely succeeded in their aim of discouraging free blacks from settling in Oregon early on, ensuring that Oregon would develop as primarily white. White immigrants who came to present-day Oregon during the 1840s and 1850s generally opposed slavery, but many also opposed living alongside African Americans. Many were non-slaveholding farmers from Missouri and other border states who had struggled to compete against those who owned slaves. To avoid a similar competitive situation in Oregon, they favored excluding blacks entirely, although a small number did settle in the region. A few immigrants brought slaves to Oregon during this time, taking advantage of the lack of enforcement of Oregon's anti-slavery laws. Oregon's small white population had voted on July 5, 1843 to prohibit slavery by incorporating it into Oregon's 1843 Organic Laws, a provision of the 1787 Northwest Ordinance. There shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in the said territory otherwise than in the punishment of crimes whereof the part the party shall have been duly convicted. The law was amended, however, on June 26, 1844, by the Provisional Government's new Legislative Council, headed by Missouri immigrant Peter Burnett. As amended, the law 
prohibited slavery, gave slaveholders a time limit to remove their slaves out of the country, and freed slaves if their owners refused to remove them. The effect uh, was to legalize slavery in Oregon for three years. Uh, moreover, once freed, a former slave could not stay in Oregon. A male, have, a male would have to leave after two years, a female after three. Any free black who refused to leave would be subject to lashing, a provision that was known as Peter Burnett's Lash Law. Burnett, who later became the first U.S. governor of California, gave the explanation for his support for the law. The object is to keep clear of that most troublesome class of population, he meant to black people. We are in a new world under the most favorable circumstances, and we wish to avoid most of those evils that have so much afflicted the United States and other countries. Because the lashing penalty was judged to be unduly harsh, the council substituted a lesser penalty later that year, and voters rescinded the law in 1845 before anyone could be punished. The law did not discourage at least one settler, George Bush, a Pennsylvania-born free black who had been a successful farmer in Missouri. After arriving in Oregon with his wife and six sons, he decided to settle north of the Columbia River near Puget Sound out of the reach of the 1844 Oregon law. The second exclusion law was enacted by the Territorial Legislature on September 21st, 1849. This law specified it shall not be lawful for any Negro or mulatto to enter into or reside in Oregon, with exceptions made for those who were already in the territory. The law targeted African-American seamen who might be tempted to jump ship. The preamble to the law addressed a concern that African Americans might intermix with Indians, instilling into their minds feelings of hostility toward the white race. The law was rescinded in 1854. At least one person was expelled under the law. Jacob Vanderpool, reportedly a sailor from the West Indies, arrived in Oregon in 1850 and was arrested and expelled from the territory. Exclusion orders uh, were issued against at least three other blacks during this period, but they received enough support from whites that they were allowed to stay. Delegates to Oregon's Constitutional Convention submitted an exclusion clause to voters on November 7, 1857, along with a proposal to legalize slavery. Voters disapproved of slavery by a wide margin, ensuring that Oregon would be a free state and approved the exclusion clause by a wide margin. Incorporated into the Bill of Rights, the clause prohibited blacks from being in the state, owning property, property and making contracts. Oregon thus became the only free state admitted to the Union with an exclusion clause in its constitution. The clause was never enforced, although several attempts were made in the legislature to pass an enforcement law. The 1865 legislature rejected a proposal for a county by county census of blacks that would have authorized the county sheriffs to deport blacks. A Senate committee killed the last attempt at legislative enforcement in 1866. The clause was rendered moot by the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, although it was not repealed by voters until 1926. Other racist language in the state constitution was removed in 2002. Although the exclusion laws were not generally enforced, they had their intended effect of discouraging black settlers. The 1860 census for Oregon, for example, reported 128 African Americans in a total population of 52,465. In 2013, only 2% of the Oregon population was black. Now, I want to talk about this article, and I'm going to be breezing through a lot of these articles and then given commentary after. But when we look at the black exclusion laws, this is textbook white supremacy. And we have to also remember that white people in the U.S. did not give up slavery out of the goodness of their heart. It was to their economic disadvantage. White workers, white farmers wanted to be able to make money. And you can't compete against a landowner who has workers who will work for free or are, for or are forced to work for free. So slavery was not abolished in the U.S. just because white people saw that it was evil or wrong or because they read Uncle Tom's Cabin, it was because it was against their economic disadvantage. Like in Oregon, they opposed slavery, but they disliked black people. The anti-blackness was in their hearts, souls, and minds. Also on top of that, we have to remember that white supremacy has allowed them to accumulate wealth and land and privilege and status in Oregon. Oregon, like many U.S. states, has a higher GDP than some countries around the world. Just one state in the U.S. has more GDP than some other countries in the world. And if you were able to get in early on Oregon, you were able to 
take up a lot of property, start a lot of businesses, accumulate a lot of wealth, and that was then passed down to uh, your generation of uh, descendants or also people who intermarried into your family as well. So while the Oregonians might say, oh, I never owned a slave or my people fought against slavery or we always voted against it. What you did do was take advantage of the white supremacist laws that allowed you that allowed you to accumulate wealth, power and land, territory, whatever, and then pass that down to your uh, descendants, which then. Uh, exclude black people. It, you can't let black people into the game after y'all have been playing in it for a hundred years and then point the finger at black people and say, why are y'all behind? Why are y'all not catching up? Y'all didn't work hard enough. Well, maybe if y'all made it a fair playing field from the beginning, we wouldn't be having these issues. Now, before, once again, I jump into the main article for today. This article, as you see, was written back in 2016. But even since 2016, Oregon has not learned. Black man told he couldn't enter Portland Bar because of his jewelry. Real reason was racism, lawsuit says. This was published on August 21st. 2019. Here is the black man here. Looks like an upstanding gentleman, probably very wealthy as well. Who knows what he does? Maybe he's a jeweler. Maybe he's a car salesman. Maybe he's a lawyer and he just likes to dress up like Rick Ross on weekends. We shouldn't judge people by their appearance. Ray Lamont Peterson, 34, claims he was told he couldn't enter Splash Bar because he was wearing too many chain necklaces. This photo shows the necklace he was wearing that night, according to his attorneys. This was written by Amy Green for the Oregonian uh, Live. So an African-American man has filed a $500,000 lawsuit against one of the owners of a Pearl District bar, claiming he was prevented from stepping foot inside because he was wearing too many chain necklaces. Ray Lamont Peterson, 34, claims that that was just a pretext for keeping the bar predominantly white. Peterson's lawsuit claims that Chris Lenahan, one of the owners of Splash Bar, would use a radio to tell security staff to start arbitrarily enforcing a dress code against African Americans. When he thought the composition of customers was getting too dark at any given time, the suit claims that Lenahan referred to black patrons by using racist terms. Peterson claims he was told he couldn't enter the club in August 2018. Reached by phone Tuesday, Lenahan told the Oregonian slash Oregon Live that the allegations in the lawsuit are ridiculous, that he has never referred to African Americans by racist terms described in the lawsuit, and that he and his partners operate the most diverse clubs with the most diverse clientele. Peterson's lawsuit was filed Monday in Multa, uh, Multnomah County Circuit Court two months after another African-American man, Sam Thompson, reached an undisclosed settlement with Lenahan and his company, Vega Stars. The Thompsons claimed that in May 2017, he was told he couldn't enter another bar that Lenahan is part of, part owner of, the Dirty Nightlife. Thompson claimed he was told he couldn't enter because he was wearing a red shirt and red shoes, and that violated dress code, prohibiting a excessively matching gang colors, even though another white customer wearing a nearly identical outfit was later let in. Lenahan maintains a huge presence on Portland's nightclub scene. Lenahan is part owner of five Old Town and Pearl District Bars, Splash Bar, Dirty Nightlife, Shake Bar, Paris Theater, and the LGBTQ Friendly Sanctuary, according to Peterson's attorney. Lenahan also speaks nationally and has authored The Little Black Bar Book, a comprehensive guide to starting, owning, and operating your own bar or nightclub. According to Peterson's lawsuit, he had arrived at Splash Bar, also known as Splash Ultra Lounge, at Northwest 9th Avenue and Couch Street for a friend's birthday party. Peterson's attorney later took a photo of him wearing the same outfit, a black t-shirt, jeans, and four thick metal necklaces with emblems. According to the suit, security staff told him his necklaces were violating the dress code, but they would not show him the dress code when he asked to see it. Peterson then asked to talk to a manager who told Peterson they did not want that kind of riffraff in the club. The lawsuit states, Peterson asked what that was supposed to mean and protested that others wearing necklaces have been allowed entry that night. The manager responded that he could come into the club if he took one or two of his chains off. Peterson's lawsuit alleges that the club and security staff violated Oregon law prohibiting unlawful discrimination in a place of public accommodation, along with Lenahan and other defendants. Peterson also is suing the security company Top Flight Entertainment and Security. A representative from the company declined comment Tuesday. Portland attorney Noah 
Horst and Timothy Volpert are representing Peterson. And I believe that is the end of the article here. Now, once again, you guys have seen on my channel me go through this same exact thing. As soon as you enter the club and you're a black man, what you're wearing doesn't matter. Your skin is what they are looking at. And also, if you look at the video that I did when I was going to the club out here in Hungary, they tried to do a little bit of the same thing. Even though we, I was wearing a suit, tie, you know, dressed down to the T to make sure that they had no excuse, wingtip shoes and all. Unfortunately, this happens everywhere, and you will never hear a bar owner or club uh, promoter or anything like that ever admitting that they are discriminating against black men. But we know that is true. When you see white people dressed like garbage enter the club, wearing the same exact outfit as you enter the club, yet and still they tell you no J's, no ball caps, no button down shirts, no white tees, no shirts with an open collar, no shirts without a button down collar, no jean jackets. No Nike shoes. They just start making up stuff. And there is never a dress code. Hidden fact, everybody. Unless they tell you ahead of time, there is no dress code for any club. They are just trying to let in as many girls as possible, which is, you know what, okay, because we want girls to be in the club. But we shouldn't be discriminating on the color of the people entering the club. This happens far too often. It happens in places that you wouldn't expect it, like my experience in Kosovo and in other places as well. For example, me being in Tunisia, this was a common occurrence as well. You need a reservation to enter. This is something that black people go through everywhere across the world. And if I were to ever go back to Portland or go back to America and move to Portland or raise my family in Portland, Portland and I'm trying to have a nice night out on the town with me and my wife or me and my kids or just me by myself, me and my boys, and we go to a club and they don't let us in because of some made up dress code that just came to mind. It would absolutely break my heart that I, you know, sacrificed and gave up so much of my life to come back to America to try to make it a better place, be an upstanding citizen. Yet and still, I'm still facing this sort of discrimination. And even though this happened in 2019, I would love to know if he won his lawsuit. But it seems like the guy, Lenahan, is probably just going to settle because another black person sued him and he just gave the money away, and we don't know the details about that as well. But let's jump here to another story, another story from the same year in Portland. Black guest who says he was asked to leave Portland Hotel sues Doubletree and Hilton for discrimination. This was written for CNN.com, published on October 10th, 2019. Seems like in Portland they were just acting up that year. And then the next year we have George Floyd happen, and then the world, you know, everybody became Black Lives Matter, Black Squares, all that sort of stuff. But this energy in Portland was existing for a long time from its inception up until very recently let's continue an african-american man who recorded video of two hotel employees asking him to leave the property last year was sued has sued hilton hotels in doubletree by hilton in portland oregon jermaine massey claimed he was falsely arrested and discriminated against because of his race when he was a guest at the doubletree by hilton on december 22nd according to the lawsuit filed on tuesday in circuit court in multanoma county seems like multanoma seems to be the most racist place <laughs> <laughs> in in uh in Oregon. Massey was seated in the hotel lobby talking on his cell phone to his mother, who lives in the East Coast, when hotel security interrupted him, demanding to know if he was a guest, his attorney said in a news release. When Mr. Massey replied that he was, the guard persisted, demanding further proof, then calling him a security threat and alerting the hotel manager who called Portland police, his attorney said. The security guard accused Massey of loitering and the manager ordered him to leave the hotel, the lawsuit said. In a series of Instagram videos recorded by Massey and obtained by CNN in December, he was heard asking the guard, but why? But I'm staying here. Not anymore, the security guard replied. At one point in the video, Massey showed the two men his key card envelope with the room number and date written on it. Police told Massey he would be arrested for trespassing if he did not leave the hotel, the lawsuit said. The police estimated escorted Mr. Massey to his room to gather his personal belongings and then led him out of the hotel in full view of other guests, his attorney said. Once the police arrived, Massey was no longer free to come and go as he wished and was allowed only to move while in police escort and under police restraint, the lawsuit said. Massey suffered, continues to suffer, and will in the future suffer from embarrassment, frustration, anger, humiliation, a sense of increased vulnerability, and feelings of racial stigmatization, the lawsuit said.
that. The lawsuit seeks $3 million in damages. It indicates that Massey plans to amend the claim for punitive damages to a figure to be determined by a jury of up to $7 million. Hilton says it has zero tolerance for racism. Doubletree by Hilton Portland's general manager apologized. We are a place of public accommodation and a place of and a place and place a strong emphasis on diversity and inclusion and our hotel does not discriminate against any individual or group he said in a statement a security guard and hotel manager who are named as defendants in the lawsuit were fired cnn unsuccessfully tried to reach the two former employees Sammy Qureshi, area general manager of the hotel management company WMK Management LLC, which owns Doubletree by Hilton Portland, said, We are committed to providing a welcoming environment to everyone who visits our property and have zero tolerance for discrimination or bias of any kind. Since the incident last year, WMK Management has made diversity, equity, and inclusion training mandatory for employees, Qureshi said in the statement. In a statement, Hilton Hotel said, Hilton has zero tolerance for racism and is committed to providing a welcoming environment for all guests. Following the incident in December 2018, Hilton accelerated scheduled training for all franchise properties globally and worked with Doubletree by Hilton Portland, Oregon an independently owned and operated property to ensure their employees have completed the diversity and unconscious bias training, the statement said. Massey has worked for the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division and the FBI, his attorney said. Wow. So the brother... Uh, the brother who you know was discriminated against actually works in the government on fighting this sort of racism that's systemic in our society yet and still he is a victim of it showing that no matter how much money we make how much education we get how much uh, how high we rise in a position of power in our jobs or in government we are still seen as an other that needs to be controlled policed and discriminated against by the dominant society and I don't like the ending of this article where they talk about Hilton's uh, diversity and inclusion uh, programs and that sort of stuff because obviously it's not working. Obviously all this training and, and bias sensitivity uh, courses that people are going through are not getting it through their thick heads that you do not need to discriminate against black people in hotels, restaurants, or bars, especially if they are patrons. This shows that white supremacy is not about uh, economic domination. It's just about pure hate against black people, unfortunately, because there is no need to discriminate against somebody who is spending money in your bar, your restaurant, your club, your hotel, anything like that. Yet and still, they still perpetuate this hatred towards us and this bias towards us just out of sheer malice. And it's sick and it's evil and it needs to stop. Anti-blackness is the devil. I hope this brother got all his money, and I'd be very interested on in following up on this story. I'm pulling out stories that I just found the most pertinent to leading up to the main article of Portland's anti-black history. And probably the most egregious example of anti-blackness happening in Portland, Oregon, was the murder the murder of this young man here, Mulageta Serra, who lived from 1960 to 1988. This is, once again, another article, I believe, from the uh, History of Oregon, uh, but the link will be in the description of this video. It was published on August 30th, 2020, and it was written by Brianna Booker. This is the picture of Mulageta Serra here, and his picture is probably in the thumbnail of this video. <coughs> Born on October 21st, 1960, a 28-year-old Mulageta Serra moved to Portland, Oregon, looking to further his education by obtaining a degree in business from Portland Community College and working multiple jobs to provide for his wife and then six-year-old son, Hanak, who remained in Ethiopia. However, this became... This became a dream unrealized when he was bludgeoned to death by three male members of neo-Nazi hate group, the White Aryan Resistance, War, and East Side uh, White Pride. Late in the evening on Friday, November 12, 1988, Kyle Brewster, Kenneth Murray, Death Milsk, Miesk and Steven Strasser approached Sarah and two other Ethiopian immigrants on Southeast 31st Avenue in front of Sarah's residence. The three verbally and physically assaulted Mulageta and his colleagues using steel toed boots. Miesk repeatedly hit Sarah with a baseball bat, leaving him in a pool of his own blood. Sarah died the following day. Rest in peace. So this is the street uh, where his name is memorialized above Southeast Pine and Southeast 31st Avenue. 
So, one week later, Brewster, Miesk, and Strasser were arrested and would be ultimately convicted. Mike pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Brewster and Strasser pleaded guilty to assault and manslaughter charges, resulting in 20-year sentences. In order to prevent attacks like this in the future, the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama, brought a lawsuit on behalf of the Sarah family against Tom Metzger, a national leader of the Ku Klux Klan and the White Aryan Resistance, and his son, John Metzger. The center won a $12.5 million judgment, which bankrupted the Alabama Ku Klux Klan and the Metzgers. Moreover, the Sarah death led to large rallies in Portland attended by people of various racial backgrounds. These rallies, which involved thousands of Portland residents, disavowed white supremacy and condemned war. The trial of the Mulligetta Sarah killers would also set a precedent in future cases and help build a large and permanent anti-racist movement in Portland. In 2018, 18, 30 years after Sarah's death, the city of Portland began to memorialize Sarah through a series of signs erected near his residence in both English and Amharic, the official language of Ethiopia. That same year, Ted Wheeler, the mayor of Portland, issued a proclamation declaring November 13th, Mulligetta Sarah Day across the city. On October 11th, 2018, Oregon Senator Ron Wyden addressed the U.S. Senate about the incident and declared that the death of Mulligetta Sarah was an affront to the values of all Oregonians. So we should never forget this man. And I truly believe that anybody who dies at the hands of white supremacists ultimately becomes a martyr. This is why I refer to Tamir Rice as a martyr, Trayvon Martin as a martyr, uh, Michael Brown as a martyr, uh, George Floyd as a martyr, and Mula Getsasera is a martyr. Because with these deaths, we unveil even more about the white supremacists, uh, how they operate, what they do, and we can better fight them and defeat them. And also, we can be prepared to defend ourselves and our families against attacks from white supremacists by knowing how they operate and being vigilant by learning of the stories of Mula Getsasera and the other martyrs that we know of. So I want to say this as well. Many black people in America, not many, some, a small minority. I'll just say this happens mostly online, though if this is happening in the real world and people are putting these talking points out there, shame on them. Some people are trying to put a divide between black immigrants in America or black people from Africa and black people from the diaspora, particularly America. And some Ethiopians might be saying we're not black, we're Ethiopian, or some black Americans or other black people from the diaspora will be saying to the Ethiopians, y'all aren't black, y'all are pseudo-Arabs or half Somalis or stuff like that because the Ethiopians have a different phenotypical look. Uh, look. They have like 3C hair, more aquiline noses, higher cheekbones, whatever, whatever. They have an interesting look. I view them as black people and most importantly, the white supremacists view them as black people. Mulligetta Sarah had nothing that could defend him against a attack of from vicious dogs that are white supremacists. When they saw him, they didn't see an Ethiopian, they didn't see a Somalian, they didn't see an East African, they didn't care about his 3C hair or his more straight nose or anything like that, though looking at his schnoz, he has a bigger one than me. Regardless, regardless, Mulligetta was classified as a black man. His nationality didn't matter, his ethnicity didn't matter, the other languages he spoke didn't matter. When it comes to the white supremacists against the world, we are enemy number one. We are enemy number one and our ethnicities don't matter. So we need to be unified and codified in being aware of white supremacy. So for any of the Ethiopians or black Americans who want to try to create that divide, we need to bridge that divide and be in, in lockstep against white supremacy, not so much infighting and bickering about who's black and who's not. We are all viewed as black. Mula Getta Sarah was viewed as black. And so because his life was lost, we need to remember this. We need to remember this. If I go back to America, nobody's going to care that, you know, I lived in Hungary or that I know other languages or that I picked up another nationality or that my wife is white or anything like that. Nobody's going to care. I am a black man. I am a black man and I have to live in this skin where it is ultimately a sin and the eyes of the white supremacists. Let's fight that together. Now, if there are any Africans who are off code and, and, and validating white supremacy or excusing the acts of white supremacists, you are our enemies too. And that same thing applies to black people in the diaspora who make apologetics for white supremacy. For anybody who wants to know more about what happened in the Mulageta Sarah murder, this link will be in the description of this video and you can read more about that. But now for the meat and potatoes of today. The racist history of Portland, the whitest city in America. 
written by Elania Samuels. Uh, very good article. Let's get into it. So Portland, Oregon, Victor Pierce has worked on the assembly line of a Daimler Trucks North American plant here since 1994. But he says that in recent years, he's experienced things that seem straight out of another time. White co-workers have challenged him to fights, mounted hangman's nooses around the factory, referred to him as boy on a daily basis, sabotaged his workstation by hiding his tools, carved swastikas in the bathroom, and written the word that starts with N and ends with R on walls in the factory. According to allegations filed in a complaint to the Multanoma, County Circuit Court in February 2015. Pierce is one of six African Americans working in the Portland plant whom the lawyer Mark Morell is representing in a series of lawsuits against Daimler Trucks North America. The cases have been combined and a trial is scheduled for January 2016. They have all complained about being treated poorly because of their race, Morell told me. It's a sad story. It's pretty ugly on the floor there. Daimler said it would not or could not comment on pending litigation, but spokesperson uh, David Garo said that the company prohibits discrimination and investigates any allegations of harassment. The allegations may seem at odds with the reputation of this city known for its progressivism, but many African Americans in Portland say they're not surprised that they hear about racial incidents in this city and state. That's because racism has been entrenched in Oregon, maybe more than any state in the North, for nearly two centuries. When the state entered the Union in 1859, for example, Oregon explicitly forbade black people from living in its borders, the only state to do so. In in more recent times, the city repeatedly undertook urban renewal projects such as the construction of Legacy Emanuel Hospital that decimated the small black community that existed here. And racism persists today. A 2011 audit found that landlord and leasing agents here discriminated against black and Latino residents 64% of the time, citing them higher rents or deposits and adding on additional fees. In area schools, African American students are suspended and expelled at a rate 4 to five times higher than that of their white peers. All in all, historians and residents say Oregon has never been particularly welcoming to minorities. Perhaps that's why they have never been many there. Uh, Portland is the whitest big city in America with a population that is 72.2% white and only 6.3% African American. I think that Portland has, in many ways, perfected neoliberal racism. Walida Imarisha, an African American educator and expert on black history in Oregon, told me. Yes, the city is politically progressive, she said, but its government has facilitated the dominance of whites in business, housing, and culture. And white supremacist sentiment is not uncommon in the state. Emarisha travels around Oregon teaching about black history, and she says neo-Nazis and others spewing sexually explicit comments or death threats frequently protest her events. Violence is not the only obstacle black people face in Oregon. A 2014 report by Portland State University and the Coalition of Communities of Color, a Portland nonprofit, shows black families lag far behind whites in the Portland region in employment, health outcomes, and high school graduation rates. They also lag behind black families nationally. While annual incomes for whites nationally and in Multnomah County, where Portland is located, were around $70,000 in 2009, blacks in Multnomah County may just $34,000 compared to $41,000 for blacks nationally. Almost two-thirds of black single mothers in Multnomah County with kids younger than five lived in poverty in 2010, compared to half of black single mothers with kids younger than five nationally. And just 32% of African Americans in Multnomah County owned homes in 2010, compared to 60% of whites in the county and 45% of blacks nationally. Oregon has been slow to dismantle overtly racist policies. The report concluded as a result, African Americans in Multnomah County continue to live with the effects of racialized policies, practices, and decision making. Now, I want to jump ahead of the gun here and say this. I know some people might watch this video and say, see, those blue states or those neoliberal cities or those left-wing progressive cities are the ones that are the worst for black people. Just look at Chicago or New York or Baltimore where Democrats run the city. 
Listen, I am not a Democrat and I don't want anybody putting that label on me. I am your worst nightmare, a socialist, communist, Marxist motherfucker. But I'll say this. I'll say this. If you're south of Canada, like I said at the beginning of this video, you are in the south. The entire United States from top to bottom systemically is anti-black. The Republicans are anti-black and the Democrats are anti-black and the people in power are anti-black and we live in an anti-black society. So of course, anywhere you go in the US, you will see disparities in health outcomes, uh, treatment in the criminal justice system, home ownership, uh, wealth, all of that. You will see disparities when you compare it along racial lines in the US because we live in a white supremacist nation. Do you get me? Do you follow me? So no, I'm not going to blame the Democrats because in Texas, it's not much better. In Louisiana, where I'm from, it's not much better. In Mississippi, it's not much better. Tennessee, none of the places where you have large numbers of black people living with Republicans and conservatives and their policies enacted is life much better for us. Oregon is a specific place that has a history of anti-blackness, which has caused a lot of its uh, uh, disparities for black people. But much like other parts of the U.S., that is tied to its history, not because of the politics of the leaders. <coughs> Whether this history can be overcome is another matter. Because Oregon, and specifically Portland, its biggest city, are not very diverse, many white people may not even begin to think about, let alone understand, the inequalities. A blog, Shit White People Say to Black and Brown Folk in PDX, details how racist Portland residents can be to people of color. Most of the people who live here in Portland have never had to directly, physically, and or emotionally interact with POC in their life cycle. One post begins. P POC, by the way, stands for people of color. I don't like that term. I'm only concerned about um, anti-blackness. Uh, there are no people of color because most of the other people of color, Asians, Arabs, Turks, Indians, they try to cling to whiteness as close as they can and try to get in closer proximity to whiteness. And so therefore they are people of color uh, when it's... Uh, convenient for them whenever they face discrimination or racism then they claim to be people of color color but then when it's time to oppress black people and join the white supremacists in maintaining the status quo they are no longer people of color they are indian now they're turkish now oh and look how straight their hair is and look how you know fair their skin has become over time let's continue here as the city becomes more popular and real estate prices rise, it is Portland's tiny African-American population that is being displaced to the far off fringes of the city, leading to even less diversity in the city center. There are about 38,000 African-Americans in the city in Portland, according to Lisa K. Bates of Portland State University. In recent years, 10,000 of those 38,000 have had to move from the center city to its fringes because of rising prices. The gentrification of the historically black neighborhood in central Portland, Albina, has led to conflicts between white Portlanders and longtime black residents over things like widening bicycle lanes and the construction of a new Trader Joe's. I've never been to Trader Joe's. What is a Trader Joe's? Is it like the Whole Foods, but it's like maxed out? Is it like, you know, Sam's Choice? You know what I mean? Is it like Sam's Club of, of Whole Foods? You know, just a larger industrial scale. You buy like 30 rolls of kale, you know, when in, in, in like Whole Foods, you just buy one, something like that. Like they sell hummus by the gallon. Is that what happens in Trader Joe's? Somebody explain what a Trader Joe's is to me. Because in Louisiana, I don't think we had any, at least when I was growing up. Never had a Whole Foods either. And I never liked Whole Foods. Whole Foods is mad expensive. Mad expensive for no reason. No reason. Anyway, I'm going to continue here. I went off on a rant. In the spate of alleged incidents at Daimler trucks is evidence of tensions that are far less subtle. Portland's tactics... Uh, Portland's tactic when it comes to race up until now has been to ignore it, says Zev Nicholson, an African-American resident who was until recently the organizing director of the Urban League of Portland, but can it continue to do so? From its very beginning, Oregon was an inhospitable place for black people. In 1844, the provisional government of the territory passed a law banning slavery and at the same time required any African-American in Oregon to leave the territory. Any black person remaining would be flogged publicly every six months until he left. Five years later, another law was passed that forbade free African Americans from entering into Oregon, according to the Communities of Color report. 
In 1857, Oregon adopted a state constitution that banned black people from coming to the state, residing in the state, or holding property in the state. During this time, any white male settler could receive 650 acres of land and another 650 if he was married. That's a lot of land to give to people for free. For free. People have to remember, you know, when they say, oh, all black people want our government handouts. All they want is a free lunch. All white people got when they got to America were free lunches from the very beginning. You could literally be white, show up in a state like Oregon, and they would give you damn near an entire county. Think about that, man. Think about how much disparity and wealth has been created has been created and kept out of the hands of black people just because of these white supremacist policies that lasted for so long. And yet we have to fight tooth and nail with people, tooth and nail to the very bitter end, just to get them to break bread with people who have been in the America for the, from the beginning, been honorary, you know, been, been the most upstanding citizens. These citizens that stand for the Constitution and what America means the most have been black people. Yet and still, we can't even get a piece of the crumbs. A piece of the crumbs. We have to fight tooth and nail just to get a seat at the table. It's a shame. It's a shame. 650 acres of land if you show up in your white and another 650 for your wife. Man, I can't even do that. <laughs> Man, I couldn't do that if I showed up in Oregon now with a million dollars. Couldn't even buy a million dollars. Couldn't even buy 650 acres of land if I had a million dollars. Think about that, man. That's crazy. Anyway, this, of course, was land taken from native people who had been living here for centuries. The early history proves to Imarisha that the founding idea of the state was a racist white utopia. The idea was to come to Oregon Territory and build the perfect white society white society you dreamed of. Matt Novak detailed Oregon's heritage as a white utopia in this 2015 Gizmodo essay. With the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, Oregon's laws preventing black people from living in the state and owning property were superseded by national law. But Oregon itself didn't ratify the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, until 1973, or more exactly, the state ratified the amendment in 1866, rescinded its ratification in 1868, and then finally ratified it for good in 1973. It didn't ratify the 15th Amendment, which gave black people the right to vote until 1959, making it one of only six states that refused to ratify that amendment when it passed. So here's a picture here, the Champaweg meeting organized early government in, or in Oregon. So the history resulted in a very white state. Technically, after 1868, black people could come to Oregon, but the black exclusion laws had sent a very clear message nationwide, says Daryl Milner, a professor of black studies at Portland State University. What those exclusion laws did was broadcast very broadly and very broadly and loudly was that Oregon wasn't a place where blacks would be welcome or comfortable, he told me. By 1890, there was slightly, there were slightly more than 1,000 black people in the whole state of Oregon. By 1920, there were about 2,000. The rise of the Ku Klux Klan made Oregon even more inhospitable for black people. The state had the highest per capita Klan membership in the country, according to Emerisha. The Democrat Walter M. Pierce was elected to the governorship in the state in 1922 with the vocal support of the Klan. And photos in the local paper show the Portland chief of police, sheriff, district attorney, U.S. attorney and mayor posing with Klansmen, accompanied by an article saying the men were taking advice from the Klan. Some of the laws passed during that time included literacy tests for anyone who wanted to vote in the state and compulsory public school for Oregonians, a measure uh, targeted at Catholics. Very interesting here. Very interesting how uh, entrenched the Klan was in government. There will be some people who will say, oh, Walter Pierce was a virulent anti-black racist and he was a Democrat. Let's get this clear out of the way. The Democrats we have today, the milk toast, weak, limped, uh, wristed, Democrats we have who can't get anything done in Congress and uh, do a lot of lip service for black people but don't do a lot to actually change the lives of black people in America but they claim to be the left wing are not the same Democrats that existed a hundred years ago. Let's get this clear. The party switch did happen in the 1960s. Many people in the South who were conservative, uh, who voted for Democrats all their life, switch leader, switch party membership to the Republicans as soon as the Civil Rights Act passed. That's True history. That's true history. Don't let anybody confuse you thinking that the Democrats have historically been the party that oppressed black people and Republicans freed the slaves and fought for civil rights. Absolutely not true. 
Absolutely not true. Let's get history clear. Both parties have worked hand in hand in oppressing black people, but one is just more lenient with it, which are the Democrats of today, the left leaning party, but they are not the Democrats of the past making that absolutely clear. So it wasn't until World War II that a sizable black population moved to Oregon, lured by jobs in the shipyards. Milner said the black population grew from 2000 to 20,000 during the war. And the majority of the new residents lived in a place called Vanport, a city of houses nestled between Portland and Vancouver, Washington, uh, constructed for the new residents. Yet after the war, blacks were encouraged to leave Oregon, Milner said, with the Portland mayor commenting in a newspaper article that black people were not welcome. The Housing Authority of Portland mauled dismantling Vanport and jobs for black people disappeared as white soldiers returned from war and displaced the men and women who had found jobs in the shipyards. Dismantling Vanport uh, proved unnecessary. In May 1948, the Columbia River flooded, wiping out Vanport in a single day. Residents had been assured that the dikes protecting the housing were safe and some lost everything in the flood. At least 15 residents died, though some locals formulated a theory that the housing authority had quietly disposed of hundreds more bodies to cover up its slow response. In 18, the 18,500 residents of Vanport, 6,300 of whom were black, had to find somewhere else to live. That sounds very, very similar to what happened in Hurricane uh, Katrina in my home state of Louisiana. Yeah, a lot of people believe that the levees broke on the black sections of the state state of the black sections of the city causing those areas to flood and the white supremacists wanted that to happen so that it would protect their neighborhoods and areas as well uh i believe this has been proven by other people but i need to look more into it but this is something that in louisiana we deeply hold and uh believe and there's been a lot of evidence pointing it to be true that when hurricane katrina hit in 2005 i remember yeah, the levees broke. Uh, this is what caused Kanye to say George Bush doesn't care about black people and that sort of stuff because, you know, the white supremacists in Louisiana, a very red state, probably, you know, did not care that the levees uh, either broke or that they were not sustainable against a powerful storm like Katrina and were okay with that happening so that they can clear out the black people from the city. You get what I'm saying? Uh, here's a picture from this flood. So, men waded through the Vanport flood of 1948. Absolutely a shame that they let, you know, those black people suffer like that. And there was no uh, recompensation for them to rebuild their community. Once again, for anybody who wants to say black people are lazy, they've never built anything in America. They, you know, they, they destroy everywhere they go countless times and times and times again throughout history. And like we've read in this article, black people go places, work good jobs, build our communities, take care of our families, create Stable income, two parent homes with mom and dad there, a husband and wife, whatever, all the stuff, all the talking points they put against us that black people aren't getting married, they don't have stable homes, they don't build stable communities. Every single time we do in America, what does America do? Put a highway through our neighborhood, burn down our neighborhood bomb our neighborhood like they did in Black Wall Street, let our neighborhoods flood like they did in Vanport, Portland, Oregon. Every single time we try to build something in America, they tear it down. They tear it down. And then they look back at us, point and say, why don't you work harder? Why don't you try to build your community? This is how the white supremacists try to constantly, constantly keep us on the hamster wheel. And we have to break those chains. Oh, oh, even as I'm talking now, I'm getting shivers down my spine just thinking about me going back to America because I would have to be a fool to do it. I would have to be a fool to go back to a nation that consistently, consistently treats black men like me treats black men like me who want to work hard and make a better society take care of our families and our communities they want to treat us like the enemy we got to get kicked out of hotels we have to get kicked out of bars our communities will be flooded and burned down it's a shame it's a shame oh oh it's mentally anguishing i am mentally anguished right now but we keep on fighting let's go 
for black residents, the only choice if they wanted to stay in Portland was a neighborhood called Albina that had emerged as a popular place to live for the black porters who worked in nearby Union Station. It was the only place black people were allowed to buy homes after, in 1919, the Realty Board of Portland had approved a code of ethics forbidding realtors and bankers from selling or giving loans to minorities for properties located in white neighborhoods. As black people moved into Albina, whites moved out. By the end of the 1950s, there were 23,000 fewer white residents and 7,000 more black residents than there had been at the beginning of the decade. The neighborhood of Albina began to be the center of black life in Portland, but for outsiders, it was something else, a blighted slum in need of repair. Today, North Williams Avenue, which cuts through the heart of what was once Albina, is emblematic of the new Portland. Fancy condos with balconies line the street next to juice stores and hipster bars with shuffleboard courts. Ed Washington remembers when this was a majority black neighborhood more than a half century ago, when his parents moved their family to Portland during the war in order to get jobs in the shipyard. He says every house on his street, save one, was owned by black families. All these people on the streets they used to be black people he told me gesturing at a couple with sleeve tattoos white people pushing baby strollers up the street since the post-war population boom albina has been the target of decades of renewal and redevelopment plans like many black neighborhoods across the country by the way, this is Imarisha. Uh, I saw a video of her on YouTube, I believe last year, and it's excellent. It's excellent. Just type uh, Black History of Oregon. Her video is one of the top ones that pop up. You can't miss her. She has the same big afro that she has in this picture. Check out that video. It is very dope. Very dope as well. Now, I want to talk about the gentrification that happened in Albina and what happens in other black areas and stuff like that. A lot of the times, these developers and people like Trump come in and say, we're going to do opportunity zones or economic platinum plan, you know, redevelopment zones and that sort of stuff. And all of these things are just ways for them to kick out the black people, raise the property value and make us move out to some far suburban place because now all the jobs are in the city centers and that sort of stuff. And the people, the white yuppies, the white leftist liberals and all that sort of stuff want to live closer to work. They want a bike. They want a scooter. They want to, you know, be able to hop skip away from the office and that sort of stuff. Meanwhile, the people who have been developing those communities, living in those areas for years are getting getting pushed out and that's not okay. We need to own our properties, not move out of certain areas. If you're a black person that owns property downtown, maintain that area. It's very important that we make sure that we are present in the heart of economic opportunity wherever we are. I'm living in downtown Budapest, so I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Let's continue here. In 1956, voters approved uh, the construction of an arena in the area which destroyed 476 homes, half of them inhabited by black people, according to Bleeding Albina, A History of Community Divest Disinvestment, 1940-2000, a paper by the Portland State Scholar Karen J. Gibson. This forced many people to move from what was considered Lower Albina to Upper Albina, but Upper Albina was soon targeted for development too. First, when the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 provided funds for Portland to build Interstate 5 and the Highway 99. Then, a local hospital expansion was approved, clearing 76 acres, including 300 African American owned homes and businesses, and many shops at the junction of North Williams Avenue and Russell Street, the Black Main Street. The Urban Renewal Report efforts. Uh, uh, pardon, let me take a step back. The urban renewal efforts made it difficult for black residents to maintain a close-knit community, the institutions that they frequently kept getting displaced from. In Portland, uh, according to Gibson, a generation of black people had grown up hearing about the wicked white people who took away their neighborhoods. In the meantime, displaced African Americans couldn't acquire new property or land. Redlining, the process of denying loans to people who lived in certain areas, flourished in Portland in the 1970s and 1980s. 80s. An investigation by the Oregonian, published in 1990, revealed that all the banks in Portland together had made just 10 
mortgage loans in a four census tract area in the heart of Albina in the course of a year. That was one tenth the average number of loans in a similarly sized census tract in the rest of the city. The lack of available capital gave way to scams. A predatory lending institution called Dominion Capital, the Oregonian alleged, also sold dilapidated homes to buyers in Albina, though the text of the contracts revealed that the uh, Dominion actually kept ownership of the properties, and most of the contracts were structured as balloon mortgages that allowed Dominion to evict buyers shortly after they'd moved in. Other lenders simply refused to give loans on properties worth less than $40,000. The state's attorney general sued Dominion's owners after the Oregonian story ran. The AP reported that the parties reached a settlement in 1993 in which Dominion's owners agreed to pay fines and to limit their business activity in the state. The company filed for bankruptcy a few days after the state lawsuit was filed. U.S. Bankruptcy Court handed control of the company to a trustee in 1991. That's a damn shame that all the banks in, in Portland only gave out 10, 10 mortgage loans to presumably black families in Albina or who wanted to buy property in Albina. Uh, now, they're probably going to say, oh, uh, you know, this place is blighted, it's dilapidated, it's crime infested, all that sort of stuff. But if people have the credit, if people have the money, if people have the job history, they shouldn't be denied mortgage loans because too many, too many Americans have been able to uh, create generational wealth for their families by owning a home. Yet and still black people have have historically been locked out of home ownership and that is very important for us to be able to own homes say we own property and pass that down to our children and get the wealth that is generated from that asset uh, so the inability of blacks to get mortgages to buy homes in the Albina led once again to the further dis decimation of the black community, Gibson argues. Homes were abandoned and residents couldn't get mortgages to buy them and fix them up. As more and more houses fell into decay, values plummeted and those who could let leave the and those who could left the neighborhood. By the 1980s, the value of homes in Albina reached 58% of the city's median. In Portland, there is evidence supporting the notion that housing market sect actors helped section off so, let's restart that because this is a weird sentence. In Portland, there is evidence supporting the notion that housing market actors helped sections of the Albina district reach an advanced stage of decay, making the area ripe for reinvestment, she writes. So what she's trying to say is that they purposely let Albina fall into disrepair to lower the property value so the developers can move in, buy it up cheap, and then sell it You know, years later at much, much higher profits. So, construction in Portland along the Williamette River. So, I'm sure Portland is a very beautiful city. I also know that it's a, you know, place that marijuana has been legalized for a long time. I'm not a marijuana smoker, but I dabble now and then. <laughs> I also heard that it's very beautiful and that there's a lot of green nature around. It's a very beautiful place, but it sucks that so many beautiful places in our beautiful nation, which is the United States of America, have such an evil, evil history under all of it. America could be a utopia, literally could be a utopia, a place where people from all walks of life do not have to identify with an ethnic, racial, religious identity to be considered a part of the nation. America is a very unique nation in that as long as you believe in the ideas of Americanness, you can be considered that. Yet and still, we have a group of people and people who are implicitly okay with the status quo, who are okay with a large section of our country being discriminated against, held out of accumulating wealth, power, and that sort of stuff, just out of pure ignorance and hatred. Because of that, this great, beautiful, vast nation that came with a lot of blood, sweat, tears, uh, evil done to the indigenous people, evil done to people who were transported across the Atlantic to work it, evil done to other people in the dominant society who are just trying to make a better society for everybody. Evil that has infected America has made the soil ripe for so much good to come from it. Yet and still, yet and still, when we look at the beautiful landscapes of places like Portland, Seattle, Chicago, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Miami, we have to remember that so much blood is under the ground and so much of it still reaps up. You get what I'm saying? I'll continue here. We're almost finished with this article. By 1988, Albina was a neighborhood known for its housing abandonment, crack cocaine activity, and gang warfare. Absentee landlord 
landlordism was rampant, with just 44% of homes in the neighborhood owner-occupied. Landlordism. Say that word five times fast. It was then, when real estate prices were at rock bottom, that white people moved in and started buying up homes and businesses, kicking off a process that would make Albina one of the more valuable neighborhoods in Portland. The city finally began to invest in Albina then, chasing out absentee landlords and working to redevelop abandoned and foreclosed homes. Much of Albina's African American population would not benefit from this process though. Some could not afford to pay for upkeep and taxes on their homes when value started to rise again. Others who rented slowly saw prices reach levels they could not afford. Even those who owned started to leave. By 1999, blacks owned 36% fewer homes than they had a decade earlier, while whites owned 43% more. This gave rise to racial tensions once again. Black residents felt they had been shouting for decades for better city policy in Albina, but it wasn't until white residents moved in that the city started to pay attention. We fought like mad to keep crime out of the area, Gibson quotes one longtime resident, Charles Ford, as saying. But the newcomers haven't given us credit for it. We never envisioned the government would come in and mainly assist whites. I didn't envision that those young people would come in with what I perceived as an attitude. They didn't come in saying, we want to be a part of you. They came in with this idea. We're here and we're in charge. It's like the revitalization of racism. Let's keep it real. I always tell people this. Some people say, oh, the new generation is getting better. The younger people don't care about race. White supremacy will die when all the old people who are around when it was more prominent go extinct. Not true. Ra racism, white supremacy is an ideology just like Islamic jihadism, just like Zionism, just like communism, just like capitalism. White supremacy is a way of thinking that will not dissipate just because younger and younger people come. In fact, the opposite will happen. The younger people are the more zealous they become about it. If that were not true, how come all of these mass shooters who walk into supermarkets or churches or schools and specifically target black people, how come all of them are around younger, younger than my brother? They're around 20, 25 years old. These young white men are on 4chan, 8 Coon, Stormfront, planning, planning their next mass shooting when they're going to slaughter innocent black people and other minorities like Jews, like Indians, like Pakistanis, like Palestinians. The next racial mass shooting, of course, will happen in the U.S. and in other parts of the world. Uh, there will be white supremacist terrorist attacks, even though they might not be classified as such. They will happen because young people are the most zealous. When I became a Muslim at around 24, 25, whenever that happened, I was a very practicing Muslim, praying five times a day, fasting Mondays and Thursdays, snipping my little mustache, wearing a thobe in hot ass Miami. I was doing all of that. The young people who are white supremacists or leaning into that way of thinking are just the same. It will not get better just because younger people come. It will revitalize itself, reinvigorate itself, find a way to reinvent itself. That's how we got Trump. That's how we still have so many right wing conservative people in America today who are making things much harder for all Americans and other people. We're seeing a rise of right-wing nationalism and fascism in Europe. Just look at, uh, I believe it was the Dutch election. I'm here in Hungary, red, led by a right-wing conservative government as well. So many places in the world, so many places in the world. Show us, show us this fallacy that young people are, are making the world a better place just by the fact of them being young and them being on TikTok and their favorite rapper being Drake or whatever is not making this world a better place. It is absolutely not. We have to actively fight white supremacy because the younger people are picking up the mantle of their parents and they're going even harder even harder anyway 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 many might think that as a progressive city known for its hyper consciousness about its own problems portland would be addressing its racial history or at least its current problems with racial inequality and displacement but portland only recently became a progressive city said milner the professor and its past still dominates some parts of government and society until the 1980s portland was firmly in the hands of the status quo the old conservative scratch my back old boys white network he said 
crime. The city had a series of police shootings of black men in the 1970s. And in the 1980s, the police department was investigated after officers ran over possums and then put the dead animals in front of black owned restaurants. Yet, as the city became more progressive and weird, full of artists and techies and bikers, it did not have a conversation about its racist past. It still tends not to, even as gentrification and displacement continue in Albina and other neighborhoods. If you were living here and you decided you wanted to have a conversation about race, you'd get the shock of your life. Ed Washington, the longtime Portland resident, told me, because people in Oregon just don't like to talk about it. The overt racism of the past has abated, residents say, but it can still be uncomfortable to traverse the city as a minority. Paul Knowles, who is African-American, moved to Portland to open a nightclub in the 1960s. He used to face the specter of whites-only signs in stores, pro prohibitions on buying real estate, and once even a bomb threat in his jazz club because of his black patrons. Now he says he notices racial tensions when he walks into a restaurant full of white people and it goes silent, or when he tries to visit friends friends who once lived in Albina who have now been displaced to the numbers which is what Portlanders call the low-income, far-off neighborhoods on the outskirts of town. Everything is kind of under the carpet, he said. Uh, the racism is still very subtle. Ignoring the issue of race can mean that the legacies of Oregon's racial history aren't addressed. Nicholson of the Urban League of Portland says that when the black community has tried to organize meetings on racial issues, community members have been able to fit into the room because 60 white environmental activists have showed up too, hoping to speak about something marginally related. Mm. See, this is the thing, man. We can't tie our issues into other issues. Anti-blackness and the fight against white supremacy has some things to do with environmentalism, LGBTQ rights, and all that sort of stuff, but we are focused on anti-blackness here. So if we're having a meeting about making Portland or any place a more equitable place for all people and fighting against white supremacy and anti-blackness, let's stay on topic. Let's not sneak in green peace in the NAACP meeting. You get what I'm saying? So, uh, protesters had a ruling about a police shooting in Portland. So this is a uh, newspaper, possibly from a very left-wing source because it's titled Socialist Worker Murdered for Being Black, Unite and Fight Against Racism. Uh, rest in peace, Trayvon Martin. <coughs> If the city talked about race, though, it might acknowledge that it's mostly minorities who get displaced and would put in place mechanisms for addressing gentrification, Imarisha said. Instead, said Bates, the city celebrated when in the early 2000s, census data showed it had a decline in black-white segregation. The reason? Black people in Albina were being displaced to far-off neighborhoods that had traditionally been white. One incident captures how residents are failing to hear one another or have any sympathy for one another. In the 2014, Trader Joe's was in negotiations to open a new store in Albina. The Portland Development Commission, the city's urban renewal agency, offered the company a steep discount on a patch of land to entice them to seal the deal. But the Portland African American Leadership Forum wrote a letter protesting the development, arguing that the Trader Joe's was the last latest attempt to profit from the displacement of African Americans in the city. By spending money criticizing Trader Joe's uh, to locate in the area, the city was creating further gentrification without working to help locals stay in the neighborhood, the group argued. Trader Joe's pulled out of the plan and people in Portland and across the country scorned the black community for opposing the retailer. Ain't that something? White people love Trader Joe's more than they do black people in their neighborhoods. They were so pissed. How dare you get rid of Trader Joe's? We want to buy kale by the pound. We need to buy quinoa by the kilo. Oh no, you Negroes need to go. <laughs> Imarisha Bates and others say that during the incident, critics of the African American community failed to take into account the history of Albina, which saw black families and businesses displaced again and again when whites wanted to move in. The history was an important and ignored part of the story. People are like, why do you bring up this history? It's gone. It's in the past. It's dead, Imarisha said. While the mechanisms may have changed, if the outcome is the same, then actually has anything changed? Obviously, that ideology of a racist white utopia is still very much in effect.
talking constructively about race can be hard, especially in a place like Portland, where residents have so little exposure to people who look differently than they do. Perhaps as a result, Portland and indeed Oregon have failed to come to terms with its ugly past. This isn't the sole reason for incidents like the alleged racial abuse at Daimler trucks or for the threats Imarisha faces when she traverses the state, but it may be part of it. Shout out to Alina, Alena Samuels. She is a former staff writer at The Atlantic. Very, 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 very well written piece. As a writer myself, I tip my hat to you. Now, uh, this was a very interesting article, and I think uh, we've covered a lot of ground on the history of anti-blackness in Oregon and in Portland in general. And I want to say this in closing. Somebody's going to jump into the comments and say, if you go to Portland, there are tons of homeless people. Portland and Seattle and a lot of the Pacific Northwest is known throughout the country for having the most homeless people in the nation. Right. And if you walk the streets of Portland or Seattle, you will see a ton of poor white people. You will see a ton of poor white people hooked on all sorts of drugs and living in dilapidated houses, squatting, uh, begging on the streets, all sorts of stuff. Musty, stanky, nasty, nasty, poor white people on the streets of Portland. Yes, they they flood the area. All right. What does that have to do with anti-blackness? I don't care if there are a million, million homeless people in Oregon or Washington or Seattle or in California. I don't care. I don't care about any of that. Not that I don't care about the people. I only care about the fact that this nation has had a history of anti-blackness. This state was explicitly anti-black. And still, so many black people who are not homeless, who are not vagabonds, who are not people who are committing crimes, loitering in the streets and that sort of stuff, get treated like crap in Portland. They destroyed black communities in Portland. Maybe, 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 think about this. Instead of getting mad at me because I don't care that there are so many poor, homeless white people in Portland or Seattle, how about you think about this? How about you care about the fact that they might be a large number of homeless people in Portland because they have been historically, historically places that have discriminated against a section of the community that could have contributed much to building houses, creating a more inclusive community, creating jobs and that sort of stuff. Maybe if Portland and Seattle didn't discriminate against their black communities, there would be more economic opportunity happening, more houses would have been built, more things could have caused the development of these places that would have not created the homeless situation today. Maybe if there wasn't anti-black racism that forced some black men and women to get into the drug trade, which then causes some white people to be strung out on the streets. Maybe if we had a society that cared more about its black citizens, the white citizens would benefit as well. That's all I have to say about this uh, episode. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all the new subscribers. I said I would make new videos when I hit 2,380 subs, and we did that last night, and I'm very surprised. I think even now I'm going to be at 2,000... Uh, 385 subs. Let me check. I said I would do a live stream when I hit that number, and I actually did. I actually just hit 2,385 subs, so I'm probably going to go live tonight. And uh, thank you so much for watching this video. Stay tuned on this channel. Y'all support your boy. Uh, I don't beg or ask for donations, but they're always appreciated. You can send it to the PayPal, or you can send a super thanks in the comments. Either way, I do this for the love, and the live I'm probably going to do next will get this channel demonetized, and I will disappear forever. Thanks for watching. Peace.